Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. This is the uh, Dunn County Health and Human Services Board for October 26th. Um, welcome to the uh, our constituents who are watching us on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, it looks like uh, Supervisor Breslin, Supervisor Steen, Supervisor Robinson, Supervisor Morehouse, Mr. Lamb, Ms. Rudy are all present. Uh, Supervisor Hagen is excused, he is ill, and Dr. Hall is at a state music uh, competition with her multi-talented son. All right, uh, we need uh, an ap approval of the meeting minutes from uh, September 28th. Those Ma were in your packet. Madam Chairman, I move approval. Supervisor Steen moves. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Lamb seconds. Any discussion on the minutes? Additions or corrections to the minutes? If not, the minutes for September 28th are approved as submitted. Is there any public comment? There is not any public comment. All right, thank you. There's no public comment. Um, we do need to talk a little bit about our next meeting. Um, your chairperson failed to remember that we are required by state statute to hold a public hearing on our budget. And we didn't get it on the agenda. It needs to be posted for two weeks. So the way that is going to work is if we can schedule our next meeting for uh, November 9th. That doesn't give us a lot of time between meetings, but hopefully that will work for all of us. Yeah. And we will then have a public hearing on the budget and in time for it to um, uh, be passed on to county board for the meeting on the 14th. All right. No. All right. Um, we are we we've asked for this presentation a couple of times because they're all really curious about what happened when the COVID public benefits were unwound, um, and and Jessica's here to Jessica Lindstrom is here to talk about what 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 has happened and some of the impacts of all of that. Um, Paula, would you like a better introduction, or are we all good with Jessica? Economic support. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Jessica Lindstrom and I am the economic support manager. Um, thank you for having me back this time in person. Um, I thought that I would start, start the this off sharing what our workload is currently looking like for our staff. As you can see, the caseload sizes have decreased since the beginning of the year. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that we have more staff that are, have gone through training. We have less vacancies, um, and so they're able to take on a caseload. So our caseload sizes have decreased mostly due to um, having more trained staff. Okay. Yeah. Any questions on that before I move on? No. Okay. As I explained in the February meeting, the emergency allotments were ending that month. You can see that in January, all of Dunn County food share residents received a combined amount of over $1 million in food share. In August, after the emergency allotments ended, they received a total of just under 600,000. But with that, you can also see that the case count and recipient count has not decreased very much. The average food share allotment per, per case has gone from about $515 to $279. With that, I've started direct conversations with Stepping Stones and Patrick has shared the following stats with me. Um, <clears throat> as you may or may not be aware, um, during the pandemic, Stepping Stones increased the number of yeah. pop-up pantries that they have. As time has gone by, they have seen a steady, a very steady increase in the utilization of all of their pantries. The biggest increase that they have noted is with the number of children utilizing the pantries, whether it's a pop-up pantry or their main pantry. These numbers here, um, Patrick wanted me to share that these are a combined amount for all of the pantries. Okay. Um, the increases could be attributed to several things. Mainly we're thinking is because of the lowered food share amounts, the higher food higher food, car, food costs, sorry, and honestly, the word of mouth. 
As more people become more aware of them, they're utilizing them more often. Mm -hmm. Questions on food share. Okay. Moving on to healthcare. Healthcare renewals started in June of this year. The graph below shows how this has been going for the entire consortium. I chose to provide the consortium numbers as staff may be completing healthcare renewals every day while working on the call center, but may never complete a renewal for a Dunn County resident um, that day. Um, so this shows just a bit of their workload along with some of the numbers. Um, some of you may be looking at the total column and wondering where these numbers are coming out. Um, so I wanted to break down each column and what that means for you. The, the totals in the received column are the total number of healthcare renewals that were initiated or started by a client that month. Okay. The in progress column are the renewals that are in a pending status or not or have not yet had a determination whether they've been approved or denied. We have we're waiting for something, usually a verification, something from the client. Okay. Withdrawn is the number of renewals that were either withdrawn by the client after they started the renewal or withdrawn as a duplicate re renewal and thus not, they did not need to submit another renewal. Oh, and so that's not necessarily not eligible. Correct. Okay. Correct. So the clients may call, may mm -hmm. call and start a renewal um, at the call center, but they, after talking, no, they no longer want the benefit with us. So they're shutting them down or they're, nope, I, I don't have enough time right now, I guess. So they have to call back and finish it. Um, so they're withdrawing, they're voluntarily withdrawing that renewal at that time. Um, and there are times like the, the, we send out paper renewal forms to all of the clients. Um, and before they receive the paper renewal forms, they may go on to our access account and complete a renewal there. Um, and then once they receive the paper, they think they have to fill that out and turn it in again. So since they're only required to complete one renewal every 12 months, that second one coming into us will be withdrawn. Yep. Got it. Okay. The total number or the total column is the actual renewals that were completed and either remained open or would, were denied in the month that they were due. Clients can complete their healthcare renewals up to three months past their renewal month. Renewals that have been initiated but not yet completed in the renewal month are not shown. So with that, the numbers in this column can change if the client completes the renewals was within that three month window after their renewal month. Okay, questions on that? Okay. The healthcare recipient count shows the numbers for Dunn County residents that are remaining open for healthcare. As you can see, the numbers are decreasing. This was expected and could be for a number of reasons, including not completing a renewal when they were required to, or no longer being eligible due to being tested under normal policies. As you can see, the adults are losing their eligibility at a higher rate than children. Um, and one factor for that is contrib directly contrib contributed to, um, they have a lower income limit than a child does. Right. So they're tested at 100% of the federal poverty level when the child is tested at 300%. Okay. And finally, the, the following chart is from the state of Wisconsin and shows the statewide medical enrollment numbers. The state is seeing approximately 20,000 cases per month that are dropping off or closing at renewals. Any questions on that? I, I thought that seemed really high. I was surprised when I looked at these data. Yep, and that's the most recent data that the state gave us. They gave that to us in the middle of September as just an FYI, this is where we're at, what we're seeing statewide. And did they attribute that to something? <laughs> Basically, they're, they're like the numbers in Dunn County could be attributed to clients not completing the renewal when they needed to do them, um, or they're just no longer eligible for them the programs when they do complete the renewal. Okay. All right, great. Any other questions? Other questions for Jessica? All right, if thank not, you. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Thank you. Very helpful. Cool. Cool, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jessica, feel free to get home at a reasonably decent hour. All right, uh, next item is our legislative agenda. If you recall, we took this up
um, last month um, basically said okay to a majority of the items, but asked for a couple um, to be expanded, changed with uh, more recent data. Um, so I'm gonna just walk us through the list um, uh, that you have in your packet. That up. Um, a is um, expanded, um, rewritten. Um, I don't. I don't have the old one in front of me. Um, the complexity of mental health and drug-related child welfare cases and the intensity of services have created challenges for the child welfare system. These burdens on the families and systems create a need to increase the children and families allocation CFA by 20%. I think that addresses it more clearly than the previous statement. Paula, yes. do you want to? Yes, yes. I um, looked into this and that is what that was being asked for and with the numbers that we currently have. Okay. Any mm -hmm. discussion, concerns about that? All right, moving on. B is the same. C is the same. D is the same, the Medicaid expansion. E is, I think, wonderfully enhanced um, from the previous version. Paula, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Thank you for that opportunity. Last month at this meeting, it was addressed that the mental health system is really in need of additional resources. And so we took a look at that. Um, when we look at the numbers and even when I presented to the county board a couple months ago regarding the need for um, therapists and, and other uh, mental health crisis type services, we certainly are seeing a, a much higher need for people um, for those services. And obviously that costs money to connect with that when we're looking at um, school surveys um, um, and what's going on with our children in school, the amount of mental health issues, the amount of suicidal thoughts, the amount of um, emotional disturbances coming from, you know, um, the um, increase in mental health need. Um, all of that to address that, we certainly are looking at needing to increase that to the 21 million um, for crisis intervention, because every time that someone um, has contact with our 24 hour um, call center, then um, we have a response back to them, um, to that individual the next day and follow up with services um, or if they are admitted to the um, hospitals, those types of things. And so we're asking for reimbursement to help um, support that program because mm -hmm. our numbers have certainly increased. The, um, the other issue that is there is that not all providers, mental health providers, will take people with individuals that have Medicaid because of the low reimbursement rate. So we're asking for that to be increased so that we the providers are actually willing to take um, individuals with that um, type of insurance. And then we have the community support program, and that is the severe and persistent mental health needs. And that really is you know what we find is that those individuals with the significant mental health, that is basically through the life of that individual. That does not go away, you know, that we have some programs with recovery where people like CCS with, you know, let's help give them the supports and services. And then um, they, they would be in recovery, hopefully, and be able to do that with some of their natural supports um, going on and maybe not need that service for the rest of their life. When we have people with this type of um, severe and persistent mental health, it is a lifelong um, journey of that individual and, and our program needs to cover that. And um, we do not receive um, near enough funding to be able to cover that. Um, and we're hoping that they would make that program like CCS where it's fully covered by the state and the county not having to pick up the majority of that cost. So that is what's covered in that paragraph. Okay. Any, any discussion, questions, observations about this one, item E? Increase funding for mental health services. All right, moving on to the next item F, which is also new. It, I mean, it was it was in the last one. This is just um, more clearly uh, phrased. Mm -hmm. We've talked about adult protective services. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, letter G is the same. Uh, H is the same. I is the same. Um, we did. Um, exclude an item, KT, on PFAS standards. Do you want to talk about that a bit? 
I didn't ask you to do that, but. No. So um, after consulting with land and water conservation and our environmental health specialist, we felt that because if the EPA standards do move through, the state will be required to adopt them. So even though there has been a lack of movement necessarily at a statewide level, that because there is some movement at a federal level, we may be able to accomplish it without this um, uh, ask to our, our local legislators. Perfect. Thank you. Any questions about that? All right. Uh, moving into uh, J, which is County Veterans Services grant funds, is the same. And the last item, K, advocate for federal funding, is the same. No other changes. All right. Any discussion before I would like us to approve this? All right. I would like a motion then to approve the Health and Human Services Legislative Agenda. Madam Chairman, I so move. Thank you, Supervisor Steen. Is there a second? A second. Ms. Rudy seconds. Any further discussion? All right, then. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, this moves forward. Uh, the Legislative Committee will meet in December. I clarified that this evening. And uh, usually we will have a meeting with our local legislators in January or February to present this. All right, thank you. Moving on, I think Veteran Services is up next. Good evening, uh, everyone. I'll start with the um, memorandum formatted document to kind of give a snapshot of activities that we've um, accomplished this last, uh, last reporting period. Uh, the first item, and, and some of these, these areas are there's going to be a little bit of redundancy because I had uh, mentioned some of them at last meeting, and so I won't elaborate too much on some of some of them because it was scheduled and then happened, and I talked a little bit about it. So we uh, participated in a coordinated public transit meeting uh, this last month. Actually, I think it was the first one I've ever been part of, but it was uh, I think good in, good information and. Uh, and knowledgeable to at least see that process. And we do have a part in that because we we do contract with Dunn County Transit for uh, veteran transportation. Although through the past uh, few years for a, a number of really good improvements that the Veterans Health, Health Administration has made, we've had a, a really a reduction in what our requirements or needs have been for transportation for veterans. Uh, to their to the healthcare appointments. Um, uh, th thankfully, we have a part time person in the office, and it was great to have her attend the uh, Chippewa Valley Tech uh, military picnic, which we we try to be part of that because we have a lot of uh, local veterans and their dependents that utilize uh, CVTC. And actually, I see a lot. Um, really, an uptick seems like there's a lot of uh, students that are looking at Chippewa Valley Tech because of their relationship with Stout and Eau Claire on the transferability of mm. credits. So they don't really lose many credits. So that really reduces costs, which is, uh, which is nice. That doesn't necessarily have as, that much to do with us at being part of that over there, but program assistant um, has been part of some of the dependent benefits. So it's a, it's a good thing to have her, her part of that. And actually when she was in intern work study she had attended it uh with with us before so that was a nice activity to have uh her represent our office and we're able to stay in uh to to manage some of the other claims activities um participate in the neighbors of dunn county their um anniversary on sunday um earlier in the in the month it was a great uh it, it, honestly I, I can't say enough about how well it was organized and the participation within within the county being there um so and i think it's a a good good credit to them and their staff it was the hot so you're trying mm -hmm. to chase some some shade around outside but it was a it was a good activity and i think anybody that attended would would say that say the same and, and we've got veterans and dependents that are at the neighbors and and so we have um i think it's important to have some maintain some of those relationships certainly um and then uh, Veterans Day is, is coming here um, 
on uh, November 11th, a lot of the uh, area businesses, schools and, and stuff will be doing some recognition uh, on that Friday. We, we're going to uh, participate at the, the Senior Center, or the, yeah, the Menominee Senior Center, um, and they've been doing a good job the past few years. They'll just have some cake and and a few few individuals come come there. More of kind of a an outing. And the the American the local American Legion has taken the lead on that, which is which is great. We'll we'll go there because we know most of the those veterans will have um, some uh, participation in in that. And then we'll be um, recognizing the the veterans at at the neighbors of Dunn County in the afternoon at at two thirty. On the state. Uh, state benefits. Um, I'd, I'd already talked a little bit last month about um, participating at the county's association and uh, giving a, assisting with a presentation uh, regarding uh, county veteran service office. And I'll just um, highlight the really what is important to to me as being part of the association's leadership is that. It's it's really about setting those expectations for the the the, the bosses of the, the supervisors, the the county managers or administrators, depending on what how they're they're governed, to to know what the expectations of their personnel should be. What should what should they expect coming out of those offices? And so that's something that I I emphasize because there's nothing wrong with having uh, uh, very transparent expectations of of what should be done, and I think that that just helps in the whole. Uh, hiring process as I look at this strategically uh, being part of the the leadership because we the more the more that um, the individuals that are part of the hiring process the more they understand about the the positions and the jobs and the expectations and the skill set the better they're going to do and bringing in the right people to do the job and so that's that's an important thing for me and being part of the uh, part of the leadership then the other the other part is is Moving into a different uh, position within our, our association's leadership as the first uh, first vice president, and a, a huge huge um, I would say uh, accomplishment as for tribal veteran service officers. So in the state of Wisconsin, we've got um, um, we kind of look at it like the power of eighty three. There's 11, 11 tribal veteran service officers, seventy two county veteran service officers. Our, our state is the first state that has ever elected a tribal veteran service officer at, to be the, the president. That's awesome. And yeah, yeah. So in, in the in the um, tribal veteran service officer, Mr. Wilbur, who my counterpart that I'll be working with in the leadership is a very well-respected individual um, within the association and, and throughout the, the state. So that's a great, great accomplishment. Um, with your leave, uh, Madam Chairman, I, I'd like to take a minute to recognize uh, Greg Quinn's uh, expertise in this area, his involvement in this area, and uh, I'd like to congratulate him on being elected the first vice president. I think it reflects on his work ethic and his understanding of, <clears throat> of what it takes to get benefits and, and serve uh, the veterans in Dunn County. I just want to get that on the record. Thank you. Well, well said. We all agree. Uh, thank thank you. you, Greg. Thank you. Um, so there, it was a, it was a great, honestly, it was a great, <clears throat> great ceremony because a lot of the, um, the Native American tribes actually, that it, a lot of pageantry that it involved was actually really, uh, really incredible uh, to, to watch, uh, watch that and kind of be part of that, even though you're, you know, sometimes you have out of body experience because you're, you're there, but you're like, boy, this is pretty cool. Uh, so it was a, and, and our, the National Association came and recognized in, in Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. So it, it, it's, um, it, it just, again, lends to credibility and the goals, you know, as an association. And, and I think I'd probably speak for any of my counterparts within any of their state associate. It's all about continuing that credibility of what, uh, what we're doing here at the county government. Um, so the next uh, next area with the fe on the federal benefits side took the opportunity at, at conference during our our uh, training and and business meeting and stuff to talk with uh, uh, Tammy um, Senator Tammy Baldwin's uh, veteran services representative to talk about a few of the systemic issues that that we see, which they're well aware of. It isn't by time. We we bubble anything up; they're already well aware of it. isn't It isn't uh, isn't like it comes as any surprises to them. But just talked about 
um, how to partner to, to fix? How can we participate with them to assist veterans or dependents? And, and it was, I spoke more about CHAMP, Champ VA, which is a health insurance program for <laughs> dependents. And um, it, it's a, there, there's, I think with the, they have a new, new system, uh, artificial intel intelligence is involved. And I think any, anybody that's in, in programs that you're using some of that, <clears throat> there's some learning that has to come with that, with those systems. And, and so with that, it's really um, pushing things off that should be approved and processed are being put in a category to check more information. And that's creating some extended delay. It'll all get fixed. It's like process with anything, but we're going to try to, we're going to try to, um, push that forward a little bit, a little bit more. So they gave us some good ideas how to work with them to, uh, for those that have delays to get them that information and they'll make sure it gets, they get their, their approved uh, health insurance faster. Um, uh, Representative Van Orden has started a veteran coalition board meeting. Uh, first meeting will be this next Monday. Uh, I'll participate in, in that. Um, and that's, uh, looking forward, and that is on a quarterly quarterly basis, and and so just to emphasize our our office again, we work for the veterans and dependents, and so whatever they want and whatever if if when we advise things have been delayed or things things need additional congressional push or support or assistance, we go where they want us to go, and and so that's why we maintain connections with every every one of our our representatives. Um, because it's what the what the veterans want and what they think is gonna is gonna get it done. We just advise on on that and assist. Um, any questions about the information that I've shared so far? Any questions for Greg? Um, I'll, I'll move to the our, the county uh, our our veteran serve report, and then I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up with uh, the financial um, documents. So on the and I, I put in your packet 2022 and the 2023, just so you have a comparable, so you can kind of look and get, we want to make sure that we're observing, identifying trends so that we can, we can get ahead or even prepare. And this, this time of year, the, uh, there's a huge uptick certainly for people ba based a lot, a lot of, it's all good stuff based upon patriotism questions, genealogy, you have that. And then, um, there, then there's just the um, the pressure cooker of life that sets in on on individuals when when the weather's changing, times are tough, um, medical stuffs increasing where where you, you can't get stuff done fast enough for individuals to help them through their uh, their their perceived crisis at the time, and so been dealing with a quite a quite a bit of uh, of that lately. But this is we're aware of this. This is kind of a trend as we head in into uh, um, the, the late late fall. Uh, to identify a couple um, in, impact statements that I'd like to like to share some um, some positives. And so the first uh, the first identification, this uh, Navy veteran um, asbestos exposure and again thanks thankfully because of the recognition of toxic exposure and hazards that veterans, especially our older veterans, you know they they slept in asbestos and you know, it was just horrible. Um, but it took us a number of appeals and working with uh, the veteran and his and his wife, um, we were able to get COPD granted as as part of asbestos. It made a huge difference for them. Um, however. Then moving towards um, the, kind of the secondary is is unfortunately on hospice now, and and COPD contributes co coronary artery disease and stuff. So we've got all that uh, approved, but the uh, VA is delaying on um, getting a percentage right, where they they know what the percentage is going to be um, for for the gentleman. But we're gonna so we're trying to get that pushed forward. But the protection for the family is now in place because of something. Um, happens to him, which it again, hospice means the end is near. Uh, we will we will be able to assist and ensure that his dependent is going to have that safety net going forward because of that grant of the coronary artery disease in relation to to his COPD. So that and he and he's aware of that, um, but we'd like to get the, get a little bit of cash in his hand before he. Mm. So he can, uh, it's it's easier to be in a be easier to be in hospice when a big check comes. So we want to try to try to help with that. Um, 
the uh, last one is, uh, you know, tough, tough situation, you know, through, through life when um, you kind of resort to, to self-medication and it impacts relationships and impacts um, a, a lot of, a lot of things. So I give a, give credit that uh, veterans been through detox numerous times, doesn't like what he, what, uh, his, where he's at when it comes to um, the the self medicating, we talk frequently in in you know kind of my role and is encouraging developing a plan, just being there waiting to so so when he chooses to say okay let's do this, um, but you can't um, you can't just decide today that you want to go to treatment. You decide you want to go to treatment today, and then you have to do an application. And then you have to get it approved. And then before you know it, another couple of cases of beer are drank and another week's gone. And, and so that is a, that's just a, an, an area that someday hopefully we'll have fixed when a person wants to go from detox right into treatment. We can offer that to them because you have a very narrow uh, time frame when somebody wants, wants help before, um, be, before they're, they're kind of overtaken by, by just life and cravings and, and stuff. So he's doing doing the best he can he's got a supportive family and but the big the why this is a I, I put this as an impact statement is because in the way the individual describes himself is just hey i'm just a hammer swinging hard working drinking marine yeah, yeah you can be but you also there's a, there is a way to get through some of the tough tough things and and he has stuff that it's taken me a, quite some time to convince him to um take uh take the shackles off of me to let me go to help get some of these the this trauma that's happened validated and and to, to create a safety net for his family which he, he you know he, he doesn't care what happens to himself it's it's unfortunate but we keep encouraging we can help him care about that but he doesn't he wants to protect his family so that's the end to that's what's leading to the sobriety and and stuff so um yeah he's, he's taking the uh, taking the shackles off of me to let me go because he, he very, very much had uh, a significant trauma that uh, that can lead to a lot with, with creating traumatic brain injury. And there's so much with with that. So that's why that's significant where it it can take it, we're salesmen. I hate to say that, <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to be a salesman, <laughs> but you have to. But at times you have to. Um, kind of sell the product that you're doing and, and create that trust and encouragement to let them uh, let let us try. And so we're, that's where we're we're at. Um, any questions about those items? And um, any questions for Greg? Yes, Madam Chairman, I have certainly a question. Supervisor Stein. Uh, Greg, I see comparing September of last year, 197 total pending claims. September of this year. 301 that's a one-third increase um uh, any idea why that's happening uh i yeah i would i would contribute that uh directly to um the the, the pact act and more people con the because of the toxic exposure people contacting us and and to be to be very excuse me uh very straightforward about um how, how things change over time you know 20 30 years ago uh the there would be one to two items on a disability claim application, maybe hearing, maybe a gunshot wound to the chest. Now, uh, honestly, we're, we're average of probably eight to 10 different items. And, and I think the eight to 10 different items are, are come from the, the available information that exists uh, through the internet. Some's true, some's kind of true, and some's not. And so the, we have that. And then also knowledge because of how, how you interconnect so many so many different conditions. People are just more more aware, uh, and and you can look at it one way as boy, people are asking for a lot, or boy, did the military really put people in hazardous stuff for a long, long time and didn't recognize it. So you can have two different mm -hmm. thoughts on that. I think truth somewhere in the in the middle. So that's what I'd, I'd attribute it to more more knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, go ahead, Greg. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll I'll go over the financial information. Um, I would say this: um, everything is 
is on track with the the budget outside of uh, one one caveat, which I there there won't be a problem, but um, because I have additional grant money that I was anticipating um, doing a carry forward, we were anticipating probably about five six thousand left because I wanted to have some hours for a part time position going into next year because we only technically had one uh, one day a week that was approved this year's budget, then we were able to add one another day because of some of the additional ARPA money. And then I wanted to spill it into next year. But uh, my plan is, is to use it up now um, and keep, you know, when I go to bed at night, keep praying and then the budget will go through just fine. And uh, we're going to use, use up that money um, this year because it's needed now. Okay. But keep it below that, um uh, benefit threshold so i don't have to answer to wrs and stuff okay? okay so that's the one caveat i'd have underneath the uh grant grant portion well done yeah. any questions on the financial statement yeah the supervisor seen thank you uh chairman uh greg uh what's your uh, it, it's probably on here but i can't seem to understand it uh, you put me on the spot now. Yeah, no. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask you for details. No, no. I'm just wondering what the uh, the estimate is uh, returning a, a negative or a positive at the end of the year. Uh, what I anticipate is there there'll be some money left over, but it'll be from the soldiers and sailors relief category because um, we'll uh, and and we'll I, I'm going to try to use as much as I can of that. That grant we had eleven thousand as our service officer grant. And then I think it was fifteen eight seventy eight, maybe plus or minus a couple of dollars. And so I'm going to use more of what I anticipated and budgeted this year of that. But I I anticipate um, some being re left from the soldier and sailors relief. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions? Before I move on to the health department, I am remiss. Um, because we have a guest tonight, in addition to Carrie and Supervisor Robinson, who are online, we have a student nurse who is um, helping in the health department. Her name is Lisa Bertetto. I hope that I'm not butchering the last name, and she has joined us online. I hope that you, I, I hope that we're keeping you, um, <laughs> I we're educating you as part of this process, but um um, welcome. We're glad to have you. Do you need to um, introduce her in any way, KT? I would just share that we are mm. excited to be on the educational journey for many RNs that are completing their BSN. And so it just gives a, a sense of what community health nursing looks like so that if they choose to go back into a hospital setting or a medical um, clinic setting, they still have that community-based exposure. Absolutely. And every now and again, we can kind of bring somebody over to the dark side um, <laughs> and people fall in love with public health and, and we're proud of that as well. So very happy to have Lisa with us. She's uh, seen some of our um, vaccination clinics and helped with some of our outreach materials. And um, I think it's it's always a win-win when we can bring a, a fantastic RN absolutely. along their BSN journey. Yeah, absolutely. And we're glad to have you. And uh, maybe you will go over to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to the health department with an excellent update and lots of interesting info. KT, you are yeah. on. Well, uh, I did want to share just a couple things that were in your packet. So, uh, Again, kind of like Greg had shared, because of how things fell, there was some duplication talking about some of the outreach we had done, but then getting it in the the update for posterity. Uh, I, one of the things I really want to lift up is that we worked with UWEC and um, some um, faith community partners to do a first annual uh, Hispanic uh, and Spanish speaking outreach campaign in Rock Creek, working with uh, a church there down in uh, Mondovi. So that was um, really good to see. Again, you have to kind of build relationships. And so maybe that second or third time around, we'll be able to reach more. Uh, there was an unfortunate change in staffing at one of our large dairies. And so we had expected more folks to show up. Oh. That didn't end up happening. But because of the other outreach we had done, uh, we were able to get some vaccinations and arms for folks that wanted it. 
and uh, connect people to care as well, in addition to the other services that were there around the table. So definitely a very large group effort. Uh, a couple of our public health nurses did a, a lot of support for uh, organization, but again, it was a, a multi-agency effort. So I wanted to lift that up because I think that was a really important opportunity that we have started for the first time. Um, I also wanted uh, to share uh, just a couple things as far as um, uh, a potential cease and desist order, which we've not done yet. Uh, so we do have an individual that is, and this is also in the packet, um, selling uh, smoked barbecued meats to the public oh, yeah. without a license. Um, hopefully that person is doing things safely, but there's no licensure. There's no assurance that it's being done safely. When you vacuum package something that you can create an environment that botulism can grow out. And so it's especially concerning. So if things aren't cooled properly, if they're not held properly, uh, that can result in a life-threatening illness. And so we're continuing to work with that, um, operator who does not want to be found and does not want to uh, provide their uh, residents um, to find them and to make sure that we are working through Corp Council to uh, issue a cease and desist order. So just to put that potentially political challenge in front of you guys for awareness. And then a couple things that I had sent out uh, just before, so day before yesterday, it all runs together. You have... Uh, <laughs> Fentanyl awareness campaign. If you guys drive on 25, you may see this billboard. Working with some grant funding from the Northwoods Coalition, uh, specifically opioid um, uh, settlement dollars. And so it has to be used for opioids to talk about the dangers of fentanyl. And so when we think about fentanyl, oftentimes where those really scary overdoses happen is where it's a laced product, either a laced cannabis or a uh, laced... Um, party illegal drug. They think they're taking something that they've taken before and it's laced and they die. Um, listening to uh, a really heart-wrenching story from um, somebody from within the UW system. It was a family and uh, their son died after taking ecstasy, a single pill of ecstasy that was laced. And so we want people to understand that it is illegal, but then there are also ramifications of doing something that um, is on the black market or gray market that uh, it is potentially more risky than you think, especially when it looks like a cute little gubby bear. Yeah, I think the billboard and the press release are very, um, very informative, nicely done. And I was excited to see that some of our news media picked it up yeah. and it did make it to the TV. Um, I've been, in, uh, I, I appreciate our saturated news uh, media market. Uh, they come to us for not only the earned media that we put out, but sometimes for other agencies. So I uh, did a, uh, an interview about uh, um, rabies, which uh, adjacent county had put out, which was fantastic. I was glad to be available. And then being able, especially as our new media partners come into very early in their career, they have questions. Um, the DNR put something out and so they called us. And so it, I'm not your person. Let's <laughs> let's talk about um, you know chronic wasting disease. Let's let's get you to the state vet. And so it was really nice to be able to be again part of their journey, still maintaining that relationship, so that when I have something that's a feel good story that they may not want to run, I can ask and we can get it to go. So that was really good. Um, and then I, I did want to share that very preliminary data around the community health needs assessment. So this is just a third of the process. So we ask the questions and then we gather secondary data. So what does the, the data from reputable sources say about the conditions that we're asking about? How do we compare to uh, comparable communities here in Wisconsin? And then how does Wisconsin compare to the nation to really help us hone in on what we should work on in our community health improvement plan or CHIP. Um, and so that data is in front of you. Mm -hmm. I will also share that I presented this with our community health educator, Caitlin, last night at the Wisconsin Towns Association meeting. Uh, we was able to do some anonymous surveys to see if it resonated. And as I've already shared with you, our surveys tend to be answered by people that look a little bit like me. So white, middle-class, um, 
and educated. educated. And so I left with um, Caitlin last night and I'm like, you know, talk to me a little bit about how you think that went. And she goes, there were so many men that took the survey. It was great. And so meeting people where they're at and being out in the community, you get a better sense for the whole of the community perspective, not just a focused um, perspective of uh, an overrepresented demographic. And so I think that was really, really helpful. So you do have the presentation as well as the survey results. We are working to have a community forum um, we're actually looking at two, probably one in the outlying areas, either in Colfax or Boyceville, and then one in Menominee, where we can do that same kind of presentation, solicit feedback, and then um, incorporate that into the community health needs assessment report that we'll get in front of you. Timing on that, KT? I would love to have first it done year. by the end of this year, but it's likely going to be first quarter. That's fine. Any questions for KT so far on the update? Yeah. Supervisor Steen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, KT, uh, on your first paragraph on the first page there, is that a misprint or what is Probably. it? Probably. No, it's not. Well, it's just, uh, WIC is an open position for administrative specialist part-time. This position will support pregnant people and families with young children in their WIC division. Yes. Uh, wouldn't uh, pregnant females be more accurate or pregnant women? So we are open to all people and all gender expressions and identities. And so some folks that are biologically able to have babies do not necessarily identify as female. So uh, we say pregnant people. Unless I miss my guess, the only ones that can have babies are females, correct? Biologically. Yeah. So what would be wrong with that? So as I shared, if you are a trans man, and so you have the biology able to carry a pregnancy, but you identify as a man, we will still see you. All families are welcome at our WIC office. Well, I, I guess so, but- uh, All right, moving on. I'm baffled by that. Moving on, KT. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so that's my update. We can talk about uh, finances. Oh, I'm sorry. I did want to share. You do have the um, uh, Wisconsin DHS yeah. memo about COVID and how we're moving. That just kind of um, gives some formality behind some updates okay. I've already provided. And then lastly, looking at our finances, so what you'll see there is a real aggressive pruning of what we think we're bringing in and what we think we're carrying forward. And so we're continuing to really hone in on what those actuals look like. I will share that there is some change in what is listed as local grants. So within our Nurse Family Partnership Program, we do have some additional ARP dollars that go directly to the client. So there are additional dollars coming in that go right to the client from Eau Claire, and then we're reimbursed. So there is some, there are some dollars that are in there. So I just wanted to show that that, that flagged for me and I wanted to make sure you guys understood that. Any questions on the financial report for public health? 4206 is the bottom line. Thank you. No further questions? All right, moving on. <clears throat> Department of Human Services staff report an excellent report. Thank as you. As usual. So, Kate, Paula, can you en enlighten us further? Sure can. Thank you. In the report that you had in the packet, we talked a little bit, I talked a little bit about Family Treatment Court and receiving the federal grant for over 800000 close to $900,000 for three years, and that um, Doug Mel, our communications um, expert with the county, is was contacting us to do a story, so hopefully that will get out there. Um, he did that. Um, I wanted to also mention, just to give a little background um, or story, um, with Family Treatment Court, we have started something that Becky um, 
came up with is to have staff at each of our all staff meetings um, talk about success cases or oh. stories. And this morning was the first one um, and it turned out to be a great idea. And I thank Becky for that, um, but it was regarding family treatment court. And so they shared a little bit about a um, multiple cases because we've had um, huge success of reunification of children that um, parents were in family treatment court this year and um, several of the parents had multiple children and so um, it was it was a huge impact on on families to be brought back together um, reunified and our budget of course that's that's helpful with that as well but I'm um, talking about um, a lady that um, actually gave birth while being in the family treatment court and a comment that she made was and she's had multiple children before she said this is the first time that I've ever been sober giving mm -hmm. birth and um, the impact that had on me and to be able to really be present uh, in this time um, uh, and being aware of what was going on and really thinking about my child instead of me was just so impactful and, um, you know, powerful. And um, they, they talked about um, the services that this lady is actually engaging in now, um, where she had not been before successful in services, tried multiple times, but not successful. But with the support of Family Treatment Court, really getting engaged in good services, also linking with CCS. So our CCS staff was there with the Family Treatment oh, nice. Court, which I love that because it shows the connection there. And they talked about teaming and how working together is really part of that success with families. Um, and so, you know, they shared um, that this this lady that they were sharing the success case um, has gone to several different types of treatment. And um, she comes back and at each team meeting monthly, she's teaching the staff different ways that they can be healthy. And so they're soaking it in and writing it down and learning from her and um, doing Doing different things that um, you know they have not experienced before, but they're that she's getting from the providers, and so she's actually turning it around and helping others, including our staff, um, engaging in that, and just so delightful. So it was wonderful to have the staff talk about that success and and give that experience. But that's just one of the ways that that's that program is impacting. And when we you know receive this large grant, it will just help to support that even more because we'll be you know continuing training with best practice practices and um, all the other things that come with that. So that was just exciting. I see that. So the next month, um, Wendy's going to come with her team, you know, with the mental health pieces of that. So exciting to see what, what they're going to come up with next with success stories. Okay. So I want to share that. Um, also, um, one of the changes I think that Becky talked about last month with her job duty changes from um, the Dale's position when, you know, with the deputy director to um, what we changed the job description with with Becky was really connecting with the community in different ways. And so in the, my report, it, it talks about uh, Becky's connection with UW Stout. And because of her, we're able to have um, those um, five to six two hour leadership trainings for free. And it's exceptional training and that we're going to get. And we do have several young, um, young as in seasoned, <laughs> um, not age, you know, but they may be young in age too, but um, as in seasoned leaders, um, managers in our department. So to be able to have phenomenal training for them to really um, get that is is really super exciting. And so I'm appreciative of Becky for that as well and, and her role within that. Well done, Becky. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about about is um, before foreshadowing next meeting is the um, changes that we're making within the department to try to capture some more revenue within our mental health program. So you're aware that we move the or that we're moving the adult protection unit within the crisis unit to try to capture some dollars there and to have some seamless services. Um, we've also met. Um, with the choices program. And if you remember when Sarah came and talked about choices in the first episode, psychosis um, program, and that right now is all grant funded, but eventually that grant may um, be um, 
chiseled away or not at all. So we're having to figure out how do we sustain that program. And so we meant to talk about how do we um, um, include that into our crisis program where we're able to build crisis for at least portion of um, the dollars that they're doing in that crisis role of training and, and helping those staff to be able to um, do what they need to do to build crisis. So there's another step of just trying to gain as many dollars as we possibly can to sustain programming without having to come back and ask for additional tax levy you know, for full amounts. So um, that's some of the work that's kind of being done behind the scenes in our department. And then I want to foreshadow next um, meeting a little bit because we will be meeting just in a couple of weeks and we will not have the normal reports um, available. For example, right. the financial report won't right. be able to be done because we won't even have any new data compared to this. Right. So to foreshadow that some of these things will look different next month. And um, I'm not sure what I can come up in a report in a couple of weeks, um, but we'll see what that is. Um, but I would like to share with you next month is our employee satisfaction survey. So this is something Chris started many years ago um, and um, we've kept up with since I um, came uh, really analyzing the employees um, satisfaction in the department with their employment, all of all the kind of details. And so we just completed another round of that and I will um, share, do a short presentation on that for you. And just to, to give you a little bit of information, we increased in satisfaction from last year. So that was great to see. So it's been keeps going up just a little bit each year from from the previous. So that's that's great after COVID and all, you know, a lot of different things and changes happening. So I was excited to get those results and I'll share them next month with you. Yeah. And I, I think um, those will be um, helpful and and modified reports for the meeting on the ninth are completely fine. Don't um, don't wear yourselves out. But I think from a policy perspective, particularly for the county board members, on this committee, it would be nice to get some high level feedback from your stay interviews, oh, sure. the kinds of things that allow us to keep our talented uh, employees on board and and being satisfied with their work and so sure. on. So at a high level, I think that would be really great. Right. I will include that and then, um, you know, focus on that instead of um, report kind of. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. that's fine. Thanks. Any concerns about that, members of the committee? All right. Thank you very much. Finances. Mm -hmm. So in front of you would be our um, monthly finances, and you'll see that we are projecting to have $844,311 to the good this year. I did meet with Jerry on this. We did have several um, grant funds um, and um, Medicaid billings that came in that kind of pushed this number up higher quite a bit. What she did um, foreshadow, though, is that some of the revenue may be a little overinflated at this time, and it may come down just a little bit next month. So I wanted to warn you that, that that 800 number may not stay there. We may get back to more of like that six, seven, I think last month was 500 and some. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it might go down just a little bit um, projecting for the end of the year, but we are in a solid place yeah, um, really for solid. the end of the year coming in. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome work. Thank you. All right. Any further questions for Ms. Winter or the Department of Human Services? All right. Uh, some items of business. As per usual, we have the vouchers this month, uh, smaller than normal, <laughs> $95,486.12. Again, this is our sort of regular old checkbook register. I need a motion to note review. Uh, Mr. Lamb, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Supervisor Steen seconds. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Uh, Any opposed? Uh, vouchers are noted. And we have a budget adjustment. Uh, again, I think these are pretty uh, self-explanatory, but um, Paula, do you want to uh, expand a bit? Sure. Um, if you remember last month, we did have in the packet a budget right. adjustment and then it wasn't on the agenda, so we could not address it. So it seems super long this time because it's two months worth of it. So, and we're getting to the end of the year. And so we're really examining like what, what is actually coming in and not with the contracts. And so that's why you're seeing some of them. Yeah. Okay. I need a motion to approve the budget adjustment for human services. Supervisor Steen moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Lamb seconds. Any further discussion? 
If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Budget adjustment is approved. And if, yes, sir. I, you moved too quickly. I wanted to vote in favor of it and I didn't get it to say that. So I voted yes. <laughs> I almost I almost jumped in and voted against it. So I just wanted what to clarify. Did I, did I say something silly? No. Oh. I was either you were either too fast or I was too slow. So okay. <laughs> it's no it, I think it's noted. <laughs> All right. So please don't forget that our next meeting is in a couple of weeks, Thursday, November 9th. Oh, I'm sorry, I completely spaced that out. Yes, 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 yes. It is not 12,000 pages. I believe that it's 700 pages. And we are not going to approve it. I think what we need to do is accept it. Number one, it's not a plan, the housing study. It is a, a statement of need. It's a compilation of a whole bunch of data. Plans may result, um, but at the moment, I would like a motion to accept the report, the housing study. I would so move. Supervisor Steen moves. Is there a second? I will. Mr. Lamb <laughs> seconds. Any discussion? I got some Supervisor Breslin, your microphone, please. Sorry about that. Uh, Chairman, I got a few issues with this. Basically, you can see it in two spots, what I'm talking about, instead of having to go through the entire thing. But in the executive summary would be the first part. And basically, the this easiest way to call it is an apples to apples comparison. When you're talking about numbers, you can make numbers do anything you want. So you have to have an apples to apples comparison. An example would be if you're talking housing sales from 2022 and the cost of a house, it's not anywhere near the same as income from 2016 to 2020. If you want to have an apples to apples comparison, it would be income from 2022 and housing sales from 2022. So that's one thing. The second one is on page 23 is a good, is a good example. And what that is, is it's showing uh, population increase. Now, all of a sudden in 2020, you've got this jump of over 2%. And they relate it back to basically saying there's an alternative uh, way of doing housing or uh, population, population increase, study. so forth and so on. But long story short, if you actually go to the Wisconsin Department of Administration, they have Dunn County at a deficit during that time frame, dropping down in population, not an increase, a decrease. I have also went to two other sites that have similarly the same thing going on. Now, granted, this is over five years from 2020 right. to 2025. So part of it is an estimate. But if you've got a decrease up till 2023, then all of a sudden you're going to have an increase in the next two years. I don't know how this is 100% uh, valid or the validity of the report. And unfortunately, what we're talking about are these numbers are what the whole plan is about. It's you have not a to plan. utilize these numbers to come up with a plan for the future as to far as for what our housing needs are, either for low income or the baby boomers getting older, so forth and so on. So there's a definitely an issue that needs to be addressed here. And we can certainly pass that along to yeah, West I, Central Regional Plan. Um, I'm sure that the, there are some, I mean, I, I know that that some of the uh, ACS data that she was looking at wasn't current because it wasn't ready. I'm sure there are some places where um, where errors have been made and can be corrected. We certainly can pass that along. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, again, this is a motion not to approve, but to accept. Uh, any further discussion? May I just... Certainly, Paula. Um, the reason that I asked to put this on the agenda was for the payment of it. The CDBG payment requires that the board look at it and accept it or not. And so in order to receive the funding for this, that's a part of this. Yes, absolutely. And I 
Paul has caught me several times. I neglected to put that on the agenda when no, this came this forward. Is, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. This is for our CDBG grant. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? No. Motion passes. Report is accepted. All right. And sorry, I forgot that. And so now to the announcement, we'll see you in a couple of weeks on the 9th of November. Anything else from anybody? Without objection, we are adjourned. <laughs>